your next presenter here for what the heck is going on, finding your way out of fair set hell. Super nice guy. Don't know a lot about him though, so I'm gonna let him uh, speak in his own words. I've always appreciated how much James cares about the user's experience. <laughs> it's more than just a popular buzzword for him. In redesigning the Expression Engine interface, I saw him research and carefully consider the user's goals, always balancing the march of improvement with the deeply embedded usage patterns of the existing user base. Kevin Smith, he sold me a desk once too. <laughs> Thanks, James. Um, I, yeah, I used to work with James at LS Lab, so that was my review of him on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, all right, so the, the talk is about uh, character sets and character set encodings and, and problems we might run into with these sorts of things. As James said, uh, my name is Kevin Smith. Uh, I am now a senior software engineer at Access Care. We are a company based out of Waco. Obviously, uh, I don't, well, perhaps not obviously. I actually live here in Nashville, so I'm a remote worker. But um, we make software that home care agencies use to manage uh, their schedule for their caregivers and send them out to people's homes. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, increasingly popular alternative to, um, to people going into nursing homes. That industry is actually booming. Um, and so we, uh, we build software for that, and it's primarily located here in the U.S., but we're starting to push out into international markets. And as we've done that, we've, we've noticed we've run into uh, encoding issues with other languages um, uh, that use characters that are not common in American English. And so we have over 1,000 databases. We've noticed that, uh, that as we started pushing the international markets, our encoding is messed up in those databases. 1,000 databases, uh, we've had to solve some of these problems at an incredible scale. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today comes from my experience uh, researching and, and determining what those problems are and how to fix them. Um, so just sort of getting the temperature of the room, how many people have seen something that, that looks like this somewhere in your code? It comes out of uh, the database and maybe it's mostly right. That, you know, you are talking about British pounds, but there's an extra character there. There's something like that. Uh, or maybe it comes out looking like this. The weird question marks. Uh, that's actually called a Unicode replacement character, by the way. Um, so when this sort of thing happens, it's like, what is going on? How can I fix this? Uh, the Japanese actually have a great word for this, uh, mojibaka. Uh, it literally means character transformation. Um, and it's what happens when text is decoded with a different character set than it was originally encoded with. Um, I'm going to be talking today about a, a common encoding issue that uh, kind of plagues a lot of very early PHP applications. Uh, it's not unique to PHP, but uh, we're talking about Expression Engine, and Expression Engine is built on PHP, uh, so we're going to focus on that. Um, the fix is a pretty technical fix that I'm going to talk about today, but it's pretty straightforward. It's just that the fundamentals are necessary before, before you can really understand the fix. And so the fundamentals around character set encoding can be a little tedious. Uh, so just stick with me. We're going we're gonna to get into that, though. Uh, for the first little bit, probably about half the talk is going to be those fundamentals. Now let's say that you've got a sentence that looks like this. And you want to save this uh, on your website. You want to save this in a database. Well, when a computer saves text content, it can't save that. What it saves is that. Because computers at the base level deal in binary. They deal in ones and zeros. Literally on a hard drive, you know, on an old uh, hard drive disk, you would have magnets that are flipped one way or the other to determine whether it's one or zero, true or false, yes or no. Um, solid state drives, it's an electrical charge that determines that. But at that base level, that's what computers are storing. So what we have to do when we're asking a computer to save data, perhaps not we, but the computer has a character set that it uses uh, to determine how to store that information. And all a character set encoding is, is a set of rules that maps a, a sequence of ones and zeros to characters. So it's just characters to ones and zeros and back again. It's just a mapping. 
Um, now, what you'll, you'll probably see different uh, terminology around uh, different software vendors and whatnot. Um, for the purposes of this talk, a character set, a char set, encoding, those are all the same thing. So you're going to hear me use different terminology, especially because uh, MySQL, for example, uses char set all over the place. So uh, in this talk especially, those are going to be, um, those are our synonyms. Um, so the ones and zeros really have no meaning on their own. We need to use character encodings to give, to give those ones and zeros meaning to allow us to read it in human readable form. So let's start sort of with the beginning. This isn't the first encoding, but uh, ASCII is the first widespread encoding uh, that, that really gained prominence and actually still in use. Uh, it stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange, and it was developed in the US in the 1960s. It's very important to remember that, developed in the US, uh, and it is a single byte character set now, a byte is eight bits. Each one of those ones and zeros that you saw earlier on the slide, that is a bit. So you put eight of those together and you've got a byte. And what a single byte character set means is that you need a byte, eight of those, those ones and zeros together, to determine what one character is. There's a one-to-one -one relationship uh, between those bytes and the character. So if we go back real quick, that is a byte and that's gonna be one character in, in the character set. In fact, that byte is the exclamation point. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship back and forth between bytes and characters in a single byte encoding like ASCII. Um, ASCII, there are a total 256 possible characters that can be, um, that can be mapped with a single byte encoding. So there are 256 possible combinations of those ones and zeros. ASCII actually only makes use of 128 of, of those sort of slots that are available in the, in the encoding. Um, and the ASCII table looks like this. It's not the whole thing. Obviously, it's just A through F, lowercase and uppercase. But you can see this. If you see this string of ones and zeros, the computer knows that's an uppercase F. So if we're trying to store that sentence and we're saying, OK, computer, um, store this for us somewhere, uh, and we don't, we don't explicitly tell the computer that it's you know, using the ASCII encoding, but probably our text editor or our web browser tells the computer which encoding we're using. But let's say that we, we tell the computer, store this uh, in the database using ASCII encoding. Uh, and then somebody else comes along and says, hey, Computer, grab those ones and zeros out of the database, and I want you to use UTF-16 UTF to decode that text. This is what's going to come out the other end. So the character set encoding is very important for us to get the human readable form of that data. That's how we determine between ones and zeros and the characters. ASCII is really powerful, real popular. Uh, it, or it was early in the 60s. It gained extremely... Uh, it qu very quickly, it, it gained prominence, um, but it doesn't include these characters, uh, any accented characters. It's only 128, uh, which covers uppercase and lowercase um, American English. It covers space, uh, backspace, some different control characters and things, but it doesn't include these characters. So what do you do if you need to write text content in languages that use these characters? Well. That's where we get the extended ASCII character sets. Extended just meaning those first 128 characters are the same as ASCII, but then these other character sets sort of extend and use the, the rest of the 128 characters for other, other characters. So we have different character sets in this, in this uh, grouping. Latin one's probably the one you're familiar with. We're going to be talking about that a lot today. It was developed for Western European languages like Spanish, Irish, Norwegian, Swedish. Um, Latin II was developed for Eastern European. It's less popular, but it, it works. It's for like Bosnian, Croatian, Czech, Polish, Eastern European languages. Latin V for Cyrillic languages like Russian, Bulgarian, uh, Serbian. Um, these all have the exact same characters, the exact same ones and zeros for, for the characters that are in the ASCII character set, and then they add on to the other end of it. Does that make sense? So they're all 
backwards compatible with ASCII. If you've encoded text in ASCII and you decode it in one of these character sets, you're not going to see any problems. It's going to come out right. OK. Well, what about when you need to write in a language uh, that uses totally different characters than these? And perhaps in a language where the characters number in the many thousands, um, like uh, a lot of like Chinese, Japanese, Korean, any, anything in East Asia is going to have a completely different alphabet using completely different characters. Um, more than 256, so you can't fit it into a single byte encoding. Well, that's where multi byte encodings come, come into play. And a multi byte encoding literally just means rather than one byte to determine a character, we're going to use some combination of two bytes, or three bytes, or four bytes. And when you do that, you've got a greater number of possibilities for your characters. When you use two bytes to determine um, your character set, you've got over 65,000. Three bytes, you've got over 16 million. And if you use four bytes to determine your characters, you've got over four trillion possibilities. And that doesn't even get into if you have a variable length encoding. And a variable length encoding just means your encoding might use one byte to determine a character, or it might use two, or it might use three. It's not going to consistently always use three or always use four uh, to determine the characters. Um, now, in multi-byte encodings, there are several uh, that have become very popular, gained a lot of prominence. Big Five is going to be one that covers mostly traditional Chinese. There's a different one that covers traditional and simplified Chinese. Um, a totally different character set for Japanese characters. Um, but as you can see, we're starting to see an explosion in a bunch of different character sets that cover the needs of one language or maybe a couple languages, but they're not compatible with all languages. So what if you're writing a document in Polish about the Chinese and you need, you know, about a particular um, document in Chinese and you need to reference that? You need both languages together. Well, that's... Um, pretty impossible given these character sets. They don't cross over. They're not compatible with each other. So what we need is like a universal encoding or Unicode. Unicode development began in the late 1980s. Um, Joe Becker from Xerox and Lee Collins and Mark Davis from Apple started investigating what it might take to have one universal encoding that would cover everything. And as, as I mentioned earlier, it, we know that was going to be possible because if you use four bytes, for example, to determine your, your characters, you've got over four trillion possibilities. That would cover all the characters used in all human languages and more. So we know that there's, there's plenty of possibilities. Um, with, with Unicode, it's, it's technically not a full encoding. Um, Unicode is just a mapping of characters to code points. Um, and so the other half of the encoding I'll get to in a second, but it's just half of the equation. Rather than characters map to strings of ones and zeros um, to bytes, it is, it is characters that map to code points. Um, there are over a million code points available in Unicode. They've not all been assigned yet, but they've determined 1.11 1, 1 .1, 1 million, a little more than that, code points for Unicode. Uh, currently, there's only 137 used. That's a little less than 13%, so they've got plenty to go. Um, and they've already covered all uh, you know, languages that are in widespread use and some that are not even widespread in use. They've, they've covered pretty much everything. Um, the Unicode Consortium actually controls this, by the way. So they're the ones who determine which characters match which code points. Um, they're the ones who release the new emojis. Um, Let's see, uh, over 137,000 code points are reserved for private use. Uh, there is a private use area of the Unicode standard that says, we don't have a character assigned to this code point and we never will. This is available, this is open, so that a private group can kind of come along and say, okay, we want to use that, and we sort of have determined that we'll have Klingon characters that point to those code points. So this, the private use area leaves open, there's your Star Trek reference, Steve. Uh, it, it leaves open the possibility of, um, of using sort of some um, more uh, private, like special use case characters. So, 
Now the other half of Unicode's encoding system is the Unicode transformation format. This is what maps those code points to the ones and zeros. So there's, there's one Unicode system that maps the, 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 as we call Unicode, it maps those characters to the code points, but there are multiple ways of mapping those code points into ones and zeros, into the bytes, um, bytes and bits. UTF-32 is one that uses four bytes for every character. Um, 32 bits, four bytes for every character. Uh, it's, it works, but it's wasteful for Western languages and it's not optimized for Eastern languages either. So um, it's not really ideal for anybody. Um, we also have variable width encodings for, um, for UTF. Uh, we've got UTF-16, uh, which uses either 16 or 32 bits. It's, um, used internally by Windows uh, and JavaScript and Java to, um, to maintain code internally. Um, and then there's the one that you've probably heard of that's wildly popular, UTF-8. It uses one, two, three, or four bytes to determine um, the code points. So it's actually really efficient because it's backwards compatible with ASCII. It's, a, it's technically an extended ASCII character set. Um, those same ones and zeros that determine an F in ASCII also determine an F in UTF-8. So if you've originally encoded something in ASCII, you can read it with UTF-8 and it works perfectly and you've got more possibilities for characters using UTF-8. So as you can see, this is why when, when you hear a recommendation on character set encodings, UTF-8 really has risen to the top of the recommendations. Now everything we've gone over so far <clears throat> is really well written in this, this article by David Zentgraf. I'm gonna leave the slide up for just a second. I highly recommend bookmark this. Um, find a way to get this into your Evernote in case this site ever goes down. It's really well thoroughly researched. It's really, really well written. It's very accessible. So uh, he starts from the ones and the zeros like I did and he goes all the way through how uh, what these implications are even in PHP and everything. It really gives you a, a thorough understanding of character set encodings. Now, what I want you to take away from this ultimately is UTF-8 is king. <clears throat> there are certain specialized circumstances in which another encoding might be preferable if you're storing terabytes of text content and you're trying to sort through these and to make sense of them, but if, you're in, if you have one of those specialized use cases, you already know this. You already know which encoding to use. You're probably not sitting in this room and you probably know way more about this than I do. So for the vast uh, number of use cases, for, for most of the time when you need to encode text, um, UTF-8 is the way to go. All right, so we've got our building blocks together. How does this sort of apply in, in the space we typically work in? We've got the web, we've got our application like Expression Engine, and we've got the database. So on the web, UTF-8 has been dominant because it's been highly recommended since about the mid 2000s. Um, if you use something like HTML5 boilerplate to uh, start your themes, uh, start your, your front end templates in Expression Engine, you're probably declaring UTF-8 at the top of each one of those files. Um, it, uh, it, it looks like this on the, in the template. Um, you can also, your, your application or your web server can determine the character set and send it as a header um, in, the, uh, in the post or in the, um, the request body um, or as a request header when it communicates to the browser. So there's multiple ways of doing it, but by far, this is recommended, this is the standard, so you're probably already doing this. Um, once we jump into PHP, PHP has a bit of a reputation for not being, uh, not, uh, being compatible with, with Unicode, and it's not entirely true. Um, for the most part, PHP doesn't care. Um, for the most part, if you're just sending data into PHP and then storing it in the database, pulling it out of the database and sending it back to your, your front end, it's just ones and zeros and PHP doesn't care. Uh, where it matters is if you're doing any kind of string comparison or um, counting characters, anything where, where the number of characters matters, then it matters, but uh, PHP actually has some really 
um, good support for that in the multi-byte string function. So we won't really get into that today, but just to say, for the most part, PHP is agnostic. It's just ones and zeros flowing through the, the application. So when you save something on the on you know, let's say a form or let's say you're adding a new channel entry, you save it. That's UTF-8, and it's going to be sent through the PHP application straight to the database. Um, now, where we get to the database is where it starts to get squirrely and where we start to sort of mess up. Uh, MySQL, um, up until version 8, the default character set was Latin 1. Um, now, we mentioned that earlier, wildly popular, meant to support Western European languages. And up till version 8, by the way, uh, version 8 came out in April of this year. So the vast majority of, of database, uh, MySQL databases that are set up, um, unless somebody has explicitly said to do otherwise, they were set up Latin 1. Um, as of version 8, UTF-8 MB4 is the new standard, um, which is the right way to go. Uh, I won't get into the details, but this is UTF-8 MB4 in MySQL is full Unicode support, full UTF-8 support. So, um, Let's see, so there are a couple of settings in MySQL that, that you really need to worry about. There's the, the connection character set, connection char set, and the column char set. Those are what matter at runtime. You probably are also familiar with like the database default, the server default, the table default. All of those only matter for creation of new, new things. The, the uh, server default matters when you create a new database and you don't declare, hey, use uh, UTF-8 for this database. Uh, it'll use the server default, and so it just cascades down. Ultimately, what matters when you're using the database, when you're sending data in and pulling it back out, are the connection char set and the column char set. So, what do those two things mean? <clears throat> the connection character set is, is essentially, if you think about it from like you're, you are the database, it's the database saying, okay, the content being sent to me is encoded with this encoding. So if I'm the database and my connection character set is Latin 1, it's me saying, all those ones and zeros you're sending to me, PHP application, I'm expecting that to be text that's encoded as Latin 1 text. The column character set is this stored information. It's the database saying, when I put this content into this field, that field is expecting that, that information to be encoded with this character set. Um, and so you can have different connection character sets and column character sets. You could, for, for example, have your connection character set be Latin 1, <clears throat> and you could have your field be UTF-8 and B4. I don't know why you'd set it up that way, but you could. And if you did, what the database would do is say, okay, right, thank you for my ones and zeros that are Latin 1 text. I know I need to store this as UTF-8 MB4, so I'm going to convert this from one encoding to the other and then store those ones and zeros in the field. And then it would do the reverse on the way back out when you're reading from the database. So those are the two things you need to worry about when it comes to uh, the database encoding setup. Now, <clears throat> the particularities of these two things have given us a, a situation where we have an unfortunate um, circumstance where we've got a problem under the, under the hood and we, don't, we didn't know it this whole time. So here's the situation. Uh, UTF-8 has been dominant on the web since the mid-2000s. PHP is mostly agnostic about encoding. MySQL's default encoding until earlier this year for new databases set up on version 8. Um, so if it wasn't newly set up on 8, which mostly is probably not the case for, for any of us, um, was Latin 1. That was the default encoding. If you don't if the PHP application itself doesn't declare the connection character set, which it can do, it can override it and say, hey, database, I know you're expecting Latin 1, but as an application, I know my data is UTF-8, so I'm going to be sending you to UTF-8 data. The PHP application can declare that to you. If you don't do that, it uses the MySQL default, which is Latin 1. So more clearly, what does that mean? Text content on the web was UTF-8. It was rolling through PHP as UTF-8. PHP sent that content to the database and said it's Latin 1, which it's not. It's UTF-8. 
said it's Latin 1, and MySQL thought it was Latin 1 and just stored it as if it was. You were, you were probably, if you started a site with PMachine or Expression Engine 1 or early versions of WordPress or early versions of move, uh, movable type, all of these different applications didn't control for this. They didn't really realize it was a problem. So if you started websites on one of these platforms early on, you were probably storing UTF-8 encoded content in database fields that thought it was Latin 1. Now, just to reassure you, this is not the case anymore. I think since EE2, EE's handled this fine. Um, modern versions of WordPress, same thing. If you started a, a recent site in the last like few years, you probably don't have this problem. But if you are shepherding a site that was started 10 years ago, you might have this problem. Um, but how is this even possible, you might ask. It, if, if the text is encoded UTF-8 and, and you say it's Latin 1, shouldn't the database just reject it and say, no, 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 this isn't, this isn't Latin 1, you're sending me UTF-8 data. Well, it can't do that, unfortunately. See, MySQL will accept any string of ones and zeros as Latin 1. The reason it will do that is that, uh, remember I was telling you, Latin, or Latin 1 is a single byte encoding. There's 256 possible characters. There's 256 possible combinations of ones and zeros if you have eight digits long, ones and zero, 256 total possible combinations of that. That means every combination is valid. <laughs> so if all you're doing is sending ones and zeros to the database, and you're telling it it's Latin one, it doesn't know otherwise. It goes, great, I'm seeing ones and zeros, that's, that's excellent. And even more pernicious perhaps, on the way back out, it just reverses the same thing. And so you're storing this data, you're telling the database it's, it's Latin one, it's not, it's UTF-8, but on the way back out, the reverse happens and it's just ones and zeros and your you know, expression engine or your PHP application just sends it right back out to the front end, tells it it's UTF-8, and you're none the wiser, it works. It looks like it works on the front end. My SQL will have trouble sorting that data and searching because it'll, it'll think it's in, it searches and sorts based on what encoding it thinks it, it has. That's where it really matters. That's where it comes into play. And so you might have noticed if you've got some characters that don't line up uh, and you can't search properly. It's, the searches aren't returning. You know something's in the database, but you search for it and it doesn't, doesn't come up. Characters outside of ASCII won't be returned. Now, if they're inside ASCII, they will. Um, because if you'll remember, you've got Latin 1, supports a certain number of characters. UTF-8 supports a lot more. Obviously, it's not scale, but it supports a lot more. But the reality is there's overlap between these two. There's a commonality, and the commonality is ASCII characters. So if your content is mostly ASCII or all ASCII, when you searched, it would work. The database is looking at the same thing, the same, the same bytes, the same ones and zeros. So it works. So this problem was hiding under there and you just didn't notice. Now people started banging the drum a while back about UTF-8, you know, especially for internationalization. We need to really get on board with UTF-8 and everything. Was, especially here in the US, mostly ignored. Um, you know, ASCII was developed in the US. Most popular character sets are ASCII compatible and so we haven't noticed the problem. We just kind of ignored the UTF-8 thing. It would start to get dropped into different applications as the new default, but uh, for the most part, we, we kind of ignored it. Um, there was something that came along that made us really start caring about character set encodings and being able to support Unicode. Um, emojis came along and all of a sudden we, we, especially here in the US, got really concerned about like, how do we store that in the database? Is that something you can, and you can, it's if full UTF-8 support would allow you to store it in the database. And so um, without really knowing what we were doing and, and and I include myself in this, I include software vendors, um, we started implementing UTF-8 support. But when we did it, we didn't really know what we were doing, and so we started sort of moving stuff around and setting new defaults here and there without really realizing what the full effect would be. <clears throat> so, you know, we might have gotten a new, uh, new upgrade of, uh, like, if we had like a WordPress site, for example, I'll pick on WordPress because I know they did this wrong. <laughs> and Expression Engine didn't, by the way. So <clears throat> um, maybe we've had an old WordPress blog before version 
we upgraded. The new default is UTF-8. They didn't do anything about the existing data. The new fields and everything, it, or if it was set up newly after version 2.2, it would be fine, but if you had a blog from before 2.2, upgraded to 2.2, the new default is UTF-8, all the new fields it sets up in the database are UTF-8. And so it seems like, you know, everything's fine. All the content from since that time is correctly encoded because now, so now WordPress has correctly defined the connection to the database is UTF-8 at the time, not, not UTF-8 in before, but at the time UTF-8. Um, and the fields are UTF-8. So all the new content stored from then on is correctly encoded. Um, although if, in the old fields, they're still Latin 1 because it didn't upgrade them. And if you're sending content over and saying it's UTF-8 and the database receives it as UTF-8 but then needs to store it in a field as Latin 1, it's going to do a conversion from UTF-8 to Latin 1, which is lossy. You don't get all the same characters in Latin 1. It's a, it's a smaller set of characters than UTF-8, so you're going you're gonna to drop characters. You're going to lose stuff. And in some ways, it just drops the character. But most of the time, MySQL will drop the rest of the content <laughs> from that field. Uh, so that's not great. And previously encoded non-ASCII characters that weren't upgraded when WordPress switched, it would all start to come back as Mojabaka. Yeah, so that's not great either, obviously. Um, you start to see a lot of stuff like this again. And no one, nobody really knows why, and so we really get into some cargo cult troubleshooting. We start changing database columns. We've heard we need to support UTF-8, so let's go change that to UTF-8. Of course, the problem is it was UTF-8 content in the field already, and it said Latin 1, and then when we changed it to UTF-8, the database converted it again to UTF-8, so now it's double converted. It's double encoded. Um, maybe a developer got into your code and started slapping UTF-8 encode and UTF-8 decode all over the place. Ultimately, just moving stuff around, trying things, and not really sure why, why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and that really has led to a lot of really sort of munged text, a lot of content that's just, it's messed up now. And, and there's no magic bullet, unfortunately. Um, so that's my, that's my happy news in my talk. Uh, there's no magic bullet, unfortunately. The, the fundamentals we just went through, though, are crucial for you to understand so that, so that when you encounter one of these problems, you can dive in and, and do the investigative work to figure out what happened and, and come up with a solution. Um, unfortunately, it's nearly impossible for a computer to auto-detect proper encoding. Um, there are some tools that can be used, um, but you need to have a massive data set and a very intelligent AI system to figure it out. Um, ultimately, because especially here in the US, most of those characters are going to be ASCII characters. And so if you say, hey, computer, figure out what encoding this is, it's going to look and go, well, it could be 40 different encodings. It's a lot of ASCII characters. There's a lot of overlap here. It's not a unique encoding, so I can't figure it out. Uh, this, um, this function in PHP, uh, if you want to use this to determine the encoding, excuse me, the encoding, please don't. It's garbage. Uh, it can't figure it out. There's, there are too many possible options um, for, for the encoding. Um, ultimately, what you need is humans to read the output after you've tried to determine encoding. Take ones and zeros. You decode it as a certain encoding. And let a human who is, who is uh, knowledgeable in that area, a subject matter expert, to read it and just determine, OK, is this are there just like gnarly digits somewhere? Does this largely make sense um, or not? There's no magic bullet. Ultimately, you need to investigate to figure out what happened and sort of try to reverse engineer what happened. Now, getting back to access care, I mentioned we have over 1,000 databases. The, the data in the database was not, not correctly set up. Um, just briefly, um, our, our code base started in 2011. so in a time period where the developers should have known to set this stuff up correctly, but they didn't. And so they didn't declare the connection. They set up the databases as Latin 1. We've got UTF-8 data rolling through from the front end through the application into the databases. 
we're storing UTF-8 data as Latin 1. It's that, it's that scenario I described earlier. That, that is what we had. And at a certain point, somebody heard about all the benefits of UTF-8. So they went in, and all of the new database tables that got set up after that were set up as UTF-8 fields. So now we're still talking to the database and saying we're sending you Latin 1 content. So now the database is taking UTF-8 ones and zeros. We're telling it it's Latin 1, so that's wrong already. It's putting it in UTF-8 fields, so it's having to convert from Latin 1 to UTF-8, so now those are double encoded fields. So that's the situation that we had after a lot of investigation we determined that. But one of the things we noticed, and this might be true for you, is that the output ultimately coming out of the database through the application, if we looked at it not necessarily in a web browser, but if we, if we uh, looked at, you know, if we output just like a file from the, from the application, uh, and we looked at just the, the text data, it was right. Um, I, I mentioned not through the browser just because the browser will do everything it can to help you out. It will lie to you and try to make it work. And so you don't want to use that as like, a, oh, it looks fine in the browser, it's probably fine. You, you're you're going to have to output it in a, in a way where you are looking at just the text. Also, uh, SQL Pro will lie to you. It's not going to help you out, so don't look at the database through like SQL Pro and you know, if you're on a Mac, um, don't look at it through that because it will also lie to you. But if, if coming out of the database through the application to like a text file or some kind of uh, reliable representation like that, if it looks right, then ultimately all you have to do, all you're really trying to do is to get the database to, to be in the right um, encoding setup. You need to have all the fields correct and you need to be telling the database you're sending UTF-8 data. Um, so there are a couple approaches. One of them, if you just need to change a few fields, you can do a targeted correction. Um, and let me just mention again very specifically, this is not a, a fix-all approach. This is a very sort of limited scope approach. If your situation is one that I've just described where on the output, your text looks right. You may have a few encoding issues, but it's largely right. You can do something like this. This is for when you have the ones and zeros in your database field you know are you know, encoded UTF-8, um, but you've told the database they're Latin 1. So the field says Latin 1. All you really need to do is to just update that so that the field is correct, is correct about the data inside of it. But if you just change the field, if you just run one of these, if you run this, like this second one here, the database will try to help you out and it'll convert those ones and zeros. You don't want it to do that. So the two-step approach is to first tell the database, all right, this field just contains binary content. Um, and what you're doing there is you are, you're breaking that connection between the old uh, encoding and the new one. So what the database will do is say, okay, it's binary. It won't touch the ones and zeros, it'll leave them where they are. Then you come back right after and you say, okay, now database, that field contains UTF-8 MB4 data. Um, and so you've just updated the label, essentially. It now correctly understands the data that's in that field. Um, we couldn't do this, though. If we were to do this for every field in all of our databases, all 1,000 databases, uh, we determined it was going to take weeks of nonstop running to fix that. Uh, we can't do that, obviously. It's going to take too long. We have to take down the database to, to update this. So we came up with a different strategy, uh, correcting the whole database at one time. Now, again, I mentioned on output, this data looks right. And so what you can do, and this is starting to get technical. My slides will be online, and so you can get this from that if you want to. But um, basically what you, the strategy was, was let's, let's do an export of that data telling the database it's Latin 1 connection so that it sends, the, it sends it over the same pipes, as it were, as it's been doing for our application. Um, and let's, let's get the export together, put it in a file. So we're going to export it the same way as our application's been reading it. And now, on the command line, in place, we're going to edit that character set declaration so that, uh, so that we update it from Latin 1 to UTF-8. Um, as I mentioned, our database was using both Latin 1 and old-style UTF-8, um, which I guess I do have to explain. My, MySQL, the UTF-8 character set in MySQL is not full UTF-8 support. It's, it's, it only supports one, two, and three bytes. So it leaves off that four, fourth byte. 
Um, so it's not full support, and you can't use emojis. It's the most important part of it. Uh, you can't use emojis. So when you want full Unicode support uh, in MySQL, you need UTF-8 MB4. So our old database was Latin 1. Um, and so what we need, ended up having to do was to say, OK, all those, and again, this is inside the export file. So all the content is in there and the, the code telling the database how to set up the database, the new database. So we tell it, we change it from UTF-8, the, the old bad style, to UTF-8 MB4, and Latin 1 to UTF-8 MB4. So all the content stays exactly the same in this file. It's not touched. But we update the, the way the database gets created. So then we import that into a test, uh, a temporary database using a UTF-8 MB4 connection, which happens, by the way, because we've changed that in the file. So it's going to use a UTF-8 MB4 connection. And um, we import it into the database. And then the most important part, you want to test the output of this new temporary database. Now, you can do it a number of different ways, but the way that we, we decided to do this, because again, we're doing this at scale over 1,000 databases, we decided to um, output all of the encoding te encoded text, text content from the database. We output all of that into a file, into a different file uh, for each database table. And then we did the same for the new temporary database. And then we just ran a diff on those, those two. For the most part, we didn't run into any issues. Most databases were fine. They, they went through the encoding just fine. But we did notice a few instances where somebody had somewhere along the line messed up. They changed a bunch of stuff, and stuff got mangled in the database. And so on our conversion, it doesn't totally look right on the other end, but it might be like one character or something. All the content's still there. One character's wrong. And we know that we can just go in manually and fix that. Um, so, so we had gotten the, the errors down to a level where it was manageable, essentially. Um, so I, I know that that's not like a silver bullet. Like I said, there's no, there's no magic bullet for this. <clears throat> it's important that you understand the, um, the landscape, how encoding works, so that you can investigate the problem. You can test some solutions and see if they work for your situation. Uh, so to sum it up, the most important thing, if, you, if you're starting a new project, UTF-8 MB4 all the way, the connection, all the fields in the database, that's the way you need to set it up, support UTF-8 and PHP and on the front end. If you start there, you're not going to have any of these issues. That's the most important part. It's also important, uh, don't deploy changes really of any kind, but certainly encoding changes into production if you don't understand what you're doing. Don't just sort of cargo cult this thing and like, well, there's this UTF-8 function in PHP. I'll just run the text through that. It says it encodes everything PHP or uh, in UTF-8. That'll work. That does not work. And that, that function is actually mislabeled. That's not really what it does. But, but know what you're doing before you do it is, is really important. Uh, otherwise, you'll probably make it worse. Um, understand the fundamentals. That's really what we're getting down to. Um, these links will be in the slides. I'll also tweet the links out. Um, but what's important is that you understand how this works before you try to go in to fix it, or you'll probably make it worse. Uh, the MySQL server team does have a, uh, a really great blog, and they have an example of debugging character set issues. So they actually walk you through some different steps that I didn't cover for how you can kind of figure out what's going on there and what the text content might be encoded as if it's, uh, if it's incorrect. Um, I would. Love feedback, so please go and, and uh, offer feedback. Uh, follow me on Twitter if you want to uh, get the link to the slides or these links that I, that I mentioned. And if you get stuck, if you start researching this and you're not sure um, what you're supposed to do, just shoot me an email. You know, peer to peer, I'm happy to help out, try to help sort of investigate this and, and get you a little bit further along the path. So please feel free to email me if you have any questions. I know lunch is coming up soon, but um, I'll try to answer any questions that might come up. Yep. How did this relate to like the drop-in replacement for MySQL? Say that again? Like the drop-in replacement for MySQL? The same. The same. Yeah. Um, Percona's the same. Um, MariaDB is the same. So, yeah. They're, they've tried to match parity with MySQL. You mentioned that you focus right hand and that you should not use the browser and that you should not use 
<laughs> so what do you use? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, I got really good at using the command line to read things, uh, to, to use the MySQL client in the command line to actually read stuff. That you can be assured of because it doesn't try to help you out. The command line shows you truly what the text is. Um, that's really where I think most of the testing ended up being done. At some point, did you see the and zeros show up? Is there a way the command line to make that um, I didn't see that. There might be. Um, not sure if it'd be helpful. Uh, obviously, like I, I used a like a converter on a website to get the ones and zeros for the slide. Um, Ultimately, those won't be helpful, though. Like, what the, it's important for you to know that so that as you're doing stuff, you can conceptually understand what's happening. But seeing the ones and zeros is probably not going to help you out. Yeah. So, it, what you ultimately, if you want to test for different encodings, you've got the data. You're going to be pulling it out. You can pull it out and just try different encodings as you pull it out to see. Okay, is it this? Does that work? I, you're most likely going to be in a circumstance where it's stored incorrectly, but it kind of works on output. And so in order to really get full support, you just want to take that output and load it back into the database in a correct way where the database is correctly understands what those ones and zeros are. So any other questions? Teach. <laughs> uh, I you can also it's too smart by half. Uh, you can use PHP to print it to a file. You can. That's fine. And um, you just you want to read it with something that's like not a a user friendly text editor. You want to use like uh, PHP Storm or like a code editor to read it. Yeah, but <clears throat> PHP will largely just. Uh, take the content and write it to the file. Um, yep. Yep. Is there a use case where you would want your connector encoding to be different than your field encoding? Um, if you, yes. If you know, the, the question being, is there a use case uh, where you would want the connection encoding to be different? If you know the content coming from a particular client, like, um, like a command line client or your PHP application as the client, if the, if the content coming from one of these sources, you know that it's encoded as Latin 5, for example, you do want to declare to the database, this is encoded Latin 5 content. Because you, you want the database to be responsible for converting it into whatever it needs for the fields. So if everything is set up correctly, if, if, if nowhere along the lines you're lying or, or the code, the, the technology is lying to itself, if it's correct, um, then you're fine. Then it'll actually do all these helpful conversions for you. So yeah, if the actual content is encoded in a particular encoding, that's the one you want to tell the database you're sending over. But if it's in Latin 5, wouldn't you want to store it in Latin 5? Possibly. But you might, it might be that you don't have control over, I'll go back to UTF-8 is king. It might be that for a particular application, you don't yet really have control over the fact that it's, it's passing around a bunch of Latin 5 encoded content. But you want to store it all in a way in the database where it supports every possible character and it's not going to be lossy. So you would store it in the more, you know, more um, expansive encoding. Yeah. So, teach. Uh, email me if, if anything comes up, if you have any questions or anything, or just shoot, shoot me a, a tweet. Happy to help out. So. Let's give it up to Kevin and Hannah.